everyone to the uh, September um, September North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council meeting. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a roll call starting from my my right, with George Mendoza. George Mendoza. Fred Arroyo. Jonathan Sproul. Tony Gerard. Stephen Cassick and Tilly. Teresa Bowie. Bill Lane. John Franklin. David Marks. And Devlin Taylor. And Ryan Kenny. Jonathan, the uh, Vice President's going to read the meeting protocol. Please. <coughs> The meeting will be conducted according to parliamentary rules. The president will have the final word on the conduct of the meeting and will cast a vote only in the event the rest of the council reaches the tax. The president will recognize the speaker to make their presentation or statement, and then he will permit the council to ask questions. We then open the floor to questions from the audience, and each audience member should introduce themselves by name and street address. No person will speak until they have been recognized by the president. Cole, you have anything from the Office of Neighborhood Services? Just that tomorrow night here at 6 30, we're having a meeting on Bartlett Place. Um, we're going to do some changes right at that corner of Bartlett and um, Salem Street at 6 30. 6 30, 6 30, right here. We have a, um, a pretty uh, packed agenda, so I'm going to. Um, I represent Council Lamatina, and I'm, 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 I'm going to be here after the meeting. If anyone has any questions they have to ask me, I just want to get going with the meeting because we have uh, lots, lots to discuss tonight. Um, I, I have Miguel Gomez Ibanez here. He's um, from the North Bennett Street School, and he um, asked to have a few minutes tonight to uh, discuss uh, the, uh, the move that North Bennett Street School is going through. They're going from the old North Bennett Street building to the uh, old printing plant on Richmond. So, Miguel, you have to say a few words. Thanks very much. Yeah. I just want to uh, let you know that we've started uh, school with uh, the Elliott School students in our building. We have seven classrooms now. 120 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are in our building. And we've moved two programs to the police station. Uh, book binding and violin making are now over there. So the city is uh, help, uh, starting to use our building, and we're starting to use the police station. We have a project review in front of the BRA, which should come up. Uh, in November, early November, uh, if not late October, so there will be opportunity to uh, have public meetings in, in conjunction with that. Uh, the ultimate uh, schedule is to switch buildings and have us be uh, operational in the printing plan of police station by September of 2013. That's 12 months from now, and we're in the design phase. So we have a lot of work to do between now and next fall. Uh, and at that time, the city will take uh, over our building and begin their renovation for the second uh, campus of the Elliott School. And I will just want to say that we're over there at 39 North Bennett Street, and anybody can walk in, please do. Call me. Uh, talk to me. I'm here to answer any questions. And as this uh, project goes, uh, we will be back in touch with everyone here. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about the, the move or the North Bennett Street School, about the Elliott expansion? We're just thrilled that it's happening. Thanks very much. So we are too. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have the kids in our place, and we love working with the Elliott School. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Um, we're going to do our committee reports now. The first is um, the Resident Parking and Traffic Committee. It's um, Ryan Kenny. Um, the resident parking exemption signs are going to start going up at the end of the month, which means um, residents will now be able to park in uh, visitor parking spots uh, beyond the two-hour limit without getting a ticket. Uh, it's going to be gradually phased in. It's not going to be on every street in the north end. Um, we don't know at this time which streets are going to start with. I imagine they're going to start with some of the smaller, less busy streets in the north end versus the main drags like Hanover, Salem, Prince Street. Um, but I'll try to get a, a list of the, the streets we're going to start with and have that posted on our website. Thank you, Ryan. Um, George Mendoza is going to uh, take up the uh, Public Safety Committee report tonight. Uh, George. Uh, I asked uh, the council to allow me to uh, speak on a couple of issues, one of them being uh, the issue of street cleaning during feast weekends uh, when the uh, North Bank is already depleted from parking spots. It's a concern to a lot of residents, particularly in my area where St. Anthony's Feast goes on, and people that are around the uh, Fisherman's Feast. Uh, the feasts take up a lot of space, and uh, at the end of the month, feasts in August also include a lot of people moving in and out of the neighborhood, so there's a lot of signs posted for uh, moving vehicles. 
And uh, a lot of people are hoping that uh, the city would uh, make an exception on those weeks and postpone the, 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 uh, the end of the week street cleaning and put it on the beginning of the following week. Or skip the Thursday, Friday cleaning if the streets are gonna be taken up on Thursday, Friday. It only makes sense. Also, anything that takes place before the feast is quickly messed up by, by the activity and the abundance of people in the neighborhood. So we're hoping that maybe uh, uh, Stephen takes it up with, uh, with uh, Salamatina, maybe Nicole can take it up with the mayor's office, and particularly the biggest piece, Fisherman's <coughs> and St. Anthony's, which are in the month of August, where a lot of people are moving out of the neighborhood, if we could make an exception on those weeks, not to have the street cleaning in the second half of the week, have it prior to the feast taking place, and have it after the feast takes place. Uh, it'd be more effective, it'd be a better use of uh, taxpayer dollars, and would, you know, be an uh, alleviate the situation uh, for all the people that own cars in the neighborhood. And the other part of the uh, safety issue that uh, I want to talk about after the big fire we had on Cooper Street uh, and the fact that we continue to become more and more the uh, the compass for uh, Suffolk University. It seems like, you know, it's, it's just it's just that's the direction the neighborhood is going into. Uh, we are not set up as campus buildings. These buildings are usually four uh, family buildings, five family buildings that don't have the proper uh, you know, safety uh, that a campus building would have. Most campus buildings are sprinkled, most campus buildings don't have kitchens in the, in the dorm rooms. Uh, these kids don't know how to cook, they don't know how to tend to themselves, uh, and uh, you know, causing nothing but trouble. We talk about this in the safety meetings all the time, about what issues are taking place with the students, and unfortunately we have a student that's critically uh, burned uh, due to, uh, you know, Perhaps an accident, perhaps somebody's wrongdoing, but nevertheless, it's an issue. And I, uh, I, I wonder, uh, you know, what we're going to tell the children's parents uh, as this continues to happen. We have people urinating from roofs. We have people fighting on fire stairs. Uh, these folks don't realize that fire stairs are very old. We're close to the ocean. They're all corroded by the salt air. The roofs are not places to stand on an edge on a fourth-story building and piss on people as they're walking by. Uh, so, you know, I've. We talk about it on the safety meetings. Boston police tells us they are educating these children. We are already four or five years into it. I haven't seen anybody's diploma on being a good neighbor, but uh, it doesn't seem to be working. So that's another concern. I live on the Endicott end of the North End, and we have a lot of elderly people there, a lot of families still living there, and everybody on my area is very concerned. I'm just voicing their concerns. And after the fire on our little area, we've already had three fires. We had a fire in the corner of Stillman Place, and Endicott, about 10 years ago, we had another fire on Endicott Street, uh, the old Endicott Street next to Manja Manja, uh, three years ago, and now we have a fire on Cooper Street. Uh, you know, we have people getting hurt already, so uh, we hope that uh, perhaps the city can do something to enforce. Uh, you talk about enforcing codes. Enforcing codes, you know, and then again, you know what I mean? If, 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 you, have a, if you have a four family building, that is designed for, for, for grown-ups to live in, not for children to live in, who have no ability of uh, knowing how to uh, handle a stove or what to do with candles and this and that thing. That, that, that raises an issue. Keep in mind that most dorms have way more uh, safety mechanisms than, 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 than these buildings do. They have uh, you know, more egresses, they have better fire stairs, they have fire sprinklers, they have fire extinguishers on every hallway. Uh, they, also don't have, they also have security, which is another big thing. We don't have, these buildings don't have security. So, something to keep in mind. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, George. The, the, the meeting was canceled last Thursday, the public safety meeting, because the, the, the election was held Thursday, and, and we have uh, Precinct 3, 2, Ward 3, Precinct 2, and Precinct 3, they, they vote here. So, we, uh, we're just going to meet next, um, next um, first Thursday of October. Um, thank you, George. Um, the Greenway uh, Committee is usually, uh, Bill usually gives us an update, but we have uh, we have the uh, pleasure of having Nancy Brennan here tonight. So we're gonna let Nancy speak in place of uh, in place of Bill Lane. He has given up his, his minutes of fame for you, Nancy. Counselor, are you coming up without a bike? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, good evening, I'm Nancy Brennan uh, with Jody Wolland. <laughs> Our director of development here, the two of us have the pleasure of just updating you on what's happening in the parks. Uh, just in, in light of time, let me talk about some of the most important things. Uh, it's been a really good season in the parks, and we're so glad 
to join with you in uh, watching the use <coughs> of the neighborhood and by all neighborhood residents and visitors to the city increase this year or the last uh, by 50% uh, and, and uh, the season's certainly not done. We're also seeing a real increase in volunteers and in the north end parks alone uh, from our season that began in May through August we have had five volunteer events uh, working in the North End Parks and over 70 volunteers coming to lend a hand. And that gives me a chance to say that there's another corporate volunteer program coming to the North End Parks in the next two weeks from State Street where their corporate volunteers will be working in the North End Parks. But that is kind of a crescendo leading up to uh, the 29th of September, which is a Saturday, which is a National Public Land Day. And we're hoping to celebrate it here in Boston uh, at the Greenway, asking for as many as 50 volunteers coming to lend a hand. And would love to uh, see any friends, neighbors, family members, or people that you can drag in and hand them a pair of gloves, thanks to my staff, and off we go. We're very proud of the North End Parks and are very glad for your support. I know you've read about something else happening on the Greenway. We've been working for a year or more uh, with uh, many people to achieve uh, a one-of-a-kind carousel for Boston that will be located on the Greenway and open about a year from now. And we have been working with a local sculptor to prepare the animals. Now the animals were all inspired by children in Boston school system, including the Elliott School. And this coming Friday from 10 to 11 at the current carousel, we'll have seven of the new carousel animals, dolphins and they're very creative kids, these kids in Boston, and whales and uh, cormorants and uh, grasshoppers, seven of the original animals carved by the sculptor for everyone to come and see. And if you're free this coming Saturday and want to see the children of the Elliott School, see what they have inspired, please come join us. And then that evening from four to seven, we'll have a free public event. And if you can't join us at 10, please come join us at four. We, I also just wanted to mention to you that tomorrow is, of course, the anniversary of September 11th. And the uh, Greenway is, uh, again this year, working with Massachusetts military heroes from 11 to 1 to invite the public uh, to work with volunteers to prepare care packages for our armed service people uh, overseas. And if you can join us then, uh, I know it's a very important event for us all. Thank you very much, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from anyone? Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we can get the agenda going. First is, um, <coughs> I'm Bill Spadafora from the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame. He's here tonight to uh, present some plans to um, erect a Tony DeMarco statue um, at the corner of Hanover and Cross Street. Um, so if you'd like to step up, Bill, you can. Just so you all know, Tony DeMarco is here as well. He is the former welterweight champion of the world. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be before you tonight. Uh, I know it was kind of on short notice, so uh, please accept my apology. Uh, this has been kind of going fast and furious uh, for the last three to, four, three to four years, but it's only been the last six months or so that we identified a few locations and we finally uh, were able to uh, get permission from the Department of Transportation with the help of a lot of good people, uh, some who have been born and raised here in the North End. Uh, I'd be remiss if I started mentioning all of them, or try to mention all of them, but uh, Steve and Sal Lamatina uh, in particular have been tremendous helps to us, uh, and, and John Romano uh, from the Department of Transportation has also been a big help, uh, along with many other people. Uh, 
the location that we have finally kind of geared in on, and, and we have it, uh, at least we have the permission to, to at least start the plans to, to put the statue there. Uh, the, the, we wanted to come before any boards to make sure that everybody was aware of what we were doing. Uh, again, it's short notice because we really want to try to uh, um, unveil the statue during the month of October, which most of you know is Italian Heritage Month. And it would fit very well with uh, Tony's uh, upbringing here in the North End. We had looked at a number of locations uh, over the last six months. Uh, some were just outside of the North End, some were in the North End, but ultimately the location that we came up with, uh, <coughs> thanks to uh, the Secretary of the Department of Transportation, uh, Mr. Davies, and John Romano, uh, is right at the corner of Hanover Street and uh, Cross Street. Now, we don't, we, the, the sculpture is done, and it's in St. Louis, Missouri. The sculpture was done by uh, a very renowned, famous sculptor who did the Bobby Orr statue and also did the, the Doug Flutie statue. So he has the credentials, and when T Tony and Dottie and I and a few others have already flown out to St. Louis, we saw the statue when it was in clay, uh, it is now uh, completed in bronze. Uh, it stands six foot one in height, uh, and the location at the corner of Hanover and Cross, if you're familiar with the wall just after the opening to Mother Anna's, as you curve around on that wall that a lot of people many times you'll see sitting there, uh, right at the intersection, that is the particular wall that we're going to be setting the statue on uh, with the blessings of, of the neighborhood and, and, uh, and anybody else that uh, we need to approach. Uh, we think it's a fabulous location. Uh, Tony, in my eyes, and I grew up idolizing this guy, uh, Tony, in my eyes, uh, represents everything about the North End. He's a living legend. Uh, he's a former welterweight champion of the world. Uh, and he's never forgotten his roots. And he still lives here. So what better place to put a statue than the gateway to maybe other people look at it otherwise, but I look at it as the gateway to the North End. Uh, you have the Rose Kennedy Greenway, beautiful piece of work right across the street. On this side here, you'll have uh, Tony DeMarco uh, in, a, in a boxing pose uh, that will be basically welcoming the people that are coming down here on the street. Uh, when you see the sculpture, you, you're going to fall in love with it because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great piece of work uh, that Harry Weber, uh, the renowned sculptor, put into it. It, it is something that uh, we've been working on f since I came on the board. Um, and a year after I came on the board, they made, made me chairman of a committee, knowing my, my, my love for Tony, they, they made me chairman of a committee and said, see what we can do to build a statue. Uh, fast forward four years later, uh, and I'm now the president of the board, uh, and we're about ready to unveil the statue. Uh, and, and with targeting, with everyone's approval, we're gonna target October 20th as an unveiling day. Okay. It's going to be a very, very proud uh, day in, in, in Boston history, especially the North End. For, for all you folks that, that are not North End residents, uh, we would like to have you all there and be all part of this. Uh, I'd love to be able to show you pictures, but that would kind of ruin the excitement. And one of the things we want to do is we want to unveil that at a, at a, at a large event on October 20th, Saturday, 1, 1 p.m. So if you mark that down and we give everybody's blessings on this, uh, the boards that we have to go before, uh, we're still doing our homework, so we're not there yet. Um, we, uh, we'd love to have you all there. Uh, I'll take any questions anybody has in regards to what we're, we're planning on doing and anything about the statue. Stephen, can I add one thing? Um, you mentioned Tony was the champion of the world. The familiar with boxing today is 457 divisions and 965 champs. He was champ of the world when there was only eight divisions and eight champs. So it's a tremendous feat. Tony, Tony it's true. Tony, Tony. <laughs> Tony actually fought some of the toughest guys uh, back then in his uh, his division. Uh, he, he he shied away from no one, uh, and he just became a great great ambassador uh, for this area, for the city. So. That's what I'm here for. Does anyone have any questions about location? You know, I know you were going over the size, and there's going to be a nice little plaque on mm -hmm. it. If you're not sure, if you don't, if you don't know what, what Bill's talking about, there's a little uh, bed with um, like boxwood hedges in it, 
and um, it's right by uh, Mother Anne's where you look down into the tunnel. So they're going to dig some of that up, and they're going to they're going to put the statue right there. Right at the curvature of where the wall, if you were to go down uh, Hanover Street, just as you make that turn, it would actually be sitting in this 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 little V right here, looking into the intersection. So, and and what we're going to do is we're going to dig down uh, there, not me. Uh, they're going to dig down 18 inches which will basically put it from the top of where those hedges are uh, to the ground level uh, where the wall sits. They're going to dig down 18 inches, they're going to pour a cement base in there, then they're going to go up two feet high with a wall, I'm not a wall, a, 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 a podium. And it'll be a 24 inch podium and then Tony will stand from, from, from toe to head will stand six foot one. It's what they call larger than life statue. <laughs> and that's what he is, larger than life. That's how, that's how they refer to it, larger than life. I had the pleasure of knowing and meeting Rocky on a number of occasions because my family was close with him because of the Sunnyhurst Dairy uh, that he was affiliated with. Uh, so I had that opportunity. And five years ago, uh, I actually uh, went to my first meeting uh, on the National Italian American Sports Hall of Fame board. Uh, and I sit down next to, who else? Tony DeMarco. I go home and my wife Donna down at the end says, uh, how'd your meeting go? And I said, it was like being a little kid in a candy store. I says, not only did I, am I on the board, because they accepted me that night, I says, I broke bread with Tony DeMarco, my boyhood idol. Uh, little did I ever think that five years later I'd be standing before you uh, and, 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 and telling you about a statue that we're going to put in his name. So, Flaming Fury of Fleet. That's, that's right. You get it. Does anyone have, um, anyone have a question about anything? <laughs> I have a, Tony has a question. <laughs> yes, Chairman. Uh, would you Kindly uh, show the people the time of Rock Marciano statue. Oh yeah, um, that's. Uh, I don't have the date on that because uh, you'll be invited to guess, not me. What, what is that uh, for Rockies? I think it is the 20, 23rd of September uh, this month. They're going to be unveiling the statue uh, for Rocky Marciano in Brockton, over near the near the high school, right at the high school field. Yeah, that's going to be quite an event. I'm hoping Tony takes me with him. Any uh, any other questions? What's the responsibility is for the upkeep of that? That's a good question. Uh, we we plan on having a um, perpetual care uh, fund uh, and, and and running continuous uh, events during the year that will help. Uh, feed that fund, uh, but and, and before I forget, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that uh, this project was uh, fully. It's, there's, there's no taxpayer money. There's no 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 money coming out of this other than one family uh, from Somerville, uh, the, the Prevotera family. The Prevotera family has funded the entire project uh, at a very large expense, uh, and we we would still be would still be fundraising uh, if it wasn't for them. And it's just a it's a great opportunity for us. Any other questions? I know how to get in touch with Bill anyway, so if the statue gets dirty but it needs to be maintained, I have his cell number. We're also going to attach some scholarships uh, to the statue. Uh, we already have a scholarship in Tony's name, but we're going to try to increase that and bring in more scholarship money uh, that will be attached to the Perpetual Care Fund as well as the Tony DeMarco Statue Fund. Uh, and hopefully it'll, uh, it'll all tie in together real nice. This is kind of something that's been, been, been it's, first of all, it's long overdue. He was the champ 50 years ago or more. And, um, you know, we, we, I'm an authentic my whole life. We, I, don't, I can't think of any other professional athlete that we own. You know, um, I think Boston has Tony Cleveland and some other guys, but Tony DeMarco is our guy. And um, we think it's awesome that they're doing it. We don't, we, don't, we don't even have a statue representing Italians anywhere in, in, in the neighborhood. I that's think this is, this is. One now, more or less. Yeah. But um, you're gonna love it. We just see it. It really is. I want to make it a, a, full, a formal endorsement, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna vote on it, just so uh, so you can have um, you know something you can go to the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame dinner tomorrow night and say uh, you know, yeah we have a meeting tomorrow night. Yeah. So if anyone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to support. A motion. Uh, motion has been seconded by Phil. Um, all in favor? I don't vote, but I vote yes, I'm the president, I can't vote, but it uh, looks like it's unanimous. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're trying to get in there Thursday night, but I 
made a couple calls and I don't have any, any response to my deal. I know the agenda is tied with it. You know, I can get in there Thursday night. Anybody can help me get in there Thursday night. I'd be in and out real quick. And with, with, with Mike to do the I don't have the agenda. I don't know if I can get in there, I'll spend less time than I did tonight before you. If I can get in Thursday night. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Dan Toscano is here representing 65 Salem Street, uh, Paulie's Taste Management Group. Um, they've applied for the licensing board for a new CB Seven Day Malt and Wine license to be operated in the uh, restaurant sandwich shop uh, during the hours of 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Go ahead, Mr. Toscano. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Good to see everybody tonight. For the record, my name is Dan Toscano, attorney at law. I have a law office located at 62B, Commercial Wharf East, Boston, 02110, phone number 617-646-4428. I represent uh, Paul Barker, who is the owner and operator of Paulie's, which is the Pace Management Group. I want to say on behalf of Paul, I spoke with him today, was scheduled to be here today. Fortunately, Paul has three young children, school starting, all fall sporting activity starting. Paul is very busy taking his three children from one sporting event to the other. So I apologize on his behalf for not being here. Paul has, um, I don't know, we were before this neighborhood uh, about a year ago, Paul had the concept of opening his own um, establishment. If those of you who know Paul, he's the nephew of Joe Pachi. Um, he's operated and managed many establishments that Joe Pachi's had in the neighborhood, one um, located on Cross Street, one in Devonshire, one in Saugus. Paul worked in all the stores as a manager, um, experience uh, in the Pachi group for many, many years. This is what he's done. He's opened his own place, made it his own. He's been very successful over the last year. What it is, it's a small takeout restaurant. It's uh, 800 square feet of uh, space on the first floor. Kitchens on the first floor has approximately 16 seats, four tables. Um, his hours, of, his current hours of operation are 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. However, he does close at nine. His license stays open, so allows him to stay open to 10, but he closes at nine. Under the new license application that we have filed for an on-premises uh, malt and wine license, uh, the hours would change from 8 a.m to 11 p.m. daily. Uh, however, whether he decides to stay open to 11, that's entirely up to him, but he would at least like 11 o'clock closing out. His menu consists of relatively soups, variety of salads, a hot and cold sandwiches, burgers, a variety of pasta dishes such as a spaghetti and meatballs, chicken ziti and broccoli, a chicken parmesan with pasta, and <coughs> at a relatively uh, reasonable price, and he's done, like I said, he's done very well. However, we do need the assistance and we apply for a beer and wine license. And the reason why we've done so is because a number of his patrons that come in, especially during the lunch and the dinner hour, would like to enjoy a glass of wine with their pasta, or like a beer with their burger or cold and hot sandwiches. And it's not a drinking establishment where people come in there and there's no bar at the establishment, not a place where he's gonna house people drinking. I understand the concern that there are a number of pouring establishments in this neighborhood, approximately maybe 90 licenses here in the neighborhood, but this is an establishment hopefully can help him out a little bit more financially. Now, we already went over why Paul Barker, as an individual, as a good character, has run a quality business over, over the last year. He's proven to be a valuable asset to, to, to this community. We've seen a number, number of establishments in this neighborhood that are high-end establishments that sell beer and wine. There are a very limited number of establishments, such as Paul Barker's, that really caters to the local North End families that don't, don't have the means or want to go out and spend hundreds of dollars for a dinner. Uh, we do have a lot of students, whether we <coughs> like the way they live or not, we do have a lot of students that don't have a lot of means to spend money on dinners, are young professionals, and Paul caters to that type of business, uh, that type of clientele, and that clientele has been asking for a glass of wine or a beer with their, uh, with their meal. Now, the, the second question is, the, is there a public need for for this particular beer and wine license. As I said earlier, we have a number of establishments in the neighborhood. However, as I just mentioned to you, we 
have very limited establishments that are reasonable for the North End families, for the families that come and visit our neighborhood that don't want to spend a, a lot of money, that want to come in for a reasonable price and have a dinner or have a lunch, that want to enjoy a glass of wine or a beer. Well, with that said, uh, I'll leave it up to the board to ask me any questions. I hope you can answer them, and I respectfully request your support for um, for this application. We do have a hearing on Wednesday, September 12th, 10 a.m. Any, anyone, else, anyone from the council have questions, Tony? Did you say it was just takeout? It's a takeout restaurant, so what, it's not takeout, you, you can sit, <coughs> order at the counter, get your food, and you take it to your table. It's not a wait service environment, so it's considered a takeout restaurant. So, so then they get a glass of wine at the counter and then take it Take back. it to their table, not to okay. not out, on premises, not off premises. Something like uh, in Berkeley, Correct. Dan, how many uh, how many people can can sit in there? How many? Sixteen seats, four tables. And uh, does he have any plans to sell the business anytime soon? Do you know, him? he owns the the unit. Um, this was his dream. He's worked for his uncle for many years, and this was his dream to have his own establishment in the neighborhood. He wanted to stay in the neighborhood, so he has no talks of selling the, the business. This this thing capacity is sixteen. Seating capacity is on his license, 16 seats. Does he have a restaurant? Does he have a down, downstairs, I believe. I might be one upstairs, I'll be honest with Georgia. I don't know. Yeah. Great. Does he, does he, he plan to leave it? Does he plan to stay any later than 11 o'clock? I can tell you this. He's currently open to, uh, his license allows him to stay open until 10 as of now. He closes at 9. He would like 11 o'clock. He doesn't anticipate staying open till 11, possibly on Friday and Saturday, but at least until 9, 10 o'clock. Because it says 11 here. So it, we did the license daily 11 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Do you think he would be willing to sign a good neighbor policy? Absolutely. That he would not come back to the board to change his hours? With the type of his staff, I would have to discuss that with him, but with the type of establishment he does have, I don't think he wants to stay open until 12. He's there 60 to 70 hours a week. He has a wife, three, three children that are very active in the community, so I, I don't anticipate, and I shall go over the details of the good neighbor agreement with him. Um, I had a question, you, you mentioned you know, being a limited number of establishments that kind of serve the population just to grab like a affordable meal. Yeah. I'm just thinking of some of the other ones in the neighborhood like Hot Tomatoes, Umberto's, um, Ernesto's, you know, my cousin's place, right? Yeah. Ernesto's. What, do those locations have um, beer? Like, well, beer you, you mentioned Umberto's. Umberto's does have beer and wine, but they close at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Hot Tomatoes does not serve beer and wine. My cousin's place does not serve beer and wine. I think the, the the opinion to express does not have a license for beer and wine. Um, uh, Ernesto's Ernesto that's changed. <coughs> Ernesto's may, Ernesto's may, for pizza. Right next door. Do they have beer? Yeah. Yes. 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 Dino's has beer and wine. They do. Yeah. So, so he just feels like, is this going to give him a competitive advantage? Uh, well, not that it gives him a competitive advantage. I think what we've seen over the course, um, the change in the neighborhood, Rents are high, mortgages are high if you own the, own the business. I mean, hopefully financially it does help him out. He's not looking to get his idea of a beer and wine license and not get four or five individuals in there just to come down and have some beer, have some glass of wine. No, the idea is to cater to some of the, the local families in the neighborhood, the, the, the tourists that have young kids that come in the neighborhood that don't want to go and spend two, three hundred dollars for a dinner at other local establishments, or some of the students. We have a lot of young professionals also that don't have the means to go spend that amount of money on a, on a meal. And he sells a variety of pastas, uh, and, you know, um, a lot of uh, the authentic Italian chicken parmesan, you see eggplant on the menu, a lot of soup <laughs> salads, and, and people want a glass of wine, you know, or a beer with, with their uh, meal or lunch. This isn't good. I'm sorry to keep following this list, but this isn't good, like a like an effort to save the business. It's still it's not an effort to save the business. He's doing he's doing well. I think it would help him. 
I think he's trying to add a service just from a businessman's point of view. He's probably trying to add an additional service to his business. He's got a business that sells food already, and he's selling entrees, he's selling sandwiches, he's selling pizzas. Pizza doesn't sell no pizzas. No. no. And they're trying to add a service to it. That's what providing an additional service will be if you serve sodas only to serve coffee. If you serve sodas and coffee, it will be to serve beer and wine. You know, that's what they're looking for. They're looking to offer another service, you know, and, and uh, so, so there, there aren't any licenses available right now? There's none available. To my knowledge, so you, there's none you available. Just explain to everybody how it works. So, in other words, if, if we agree, if everybody agreed that um, he could be granted the possibility of a license, he's not right. going to no start guarantee. pouring tomorrow because there's no guarantee that Absolutely he Absolutely not. He doesn't have a license to pour um, alcoholic beverages. Um, just, from my knowledge, there's no beer and wine license available at City Hall. What would happen is we would have our hearing on Wednesday. Uh, we did ask because we, we got a residence association meeting on Thursday that the vote won't be deferred until the following week. They may or may not vote on it. They may defer it for a couple of weeks. And then at some point within 30 days or 30 days, if there's still no license available, they would deny you without prejudice, meaning that you have the opportunity to refile. So Dan, and then, she, then they can refile without coming in. They continue to refile. We can continue to refile. So, so in other words, can you just explain to everybody that if there are 90 licenses out there, there are only going to be 90, whether we approve or disapprove, right? He has to wait for a license to no, be available. No, there is no quota. There is a quota in the city of Boston. There's a number of licenses that the city of Boston has, and that includes all alcohol licenses, malt and wine, package store licenses. However, there is no limit not the same to, the north to the north end or to any other part of the city of Boston. The city of Boston has a quota, but the licensing board can grant as many licenses as they wish, as they wish in the neighborhood. There's a waiting list for about 60 people, or 60 businesses. They but they, they, they go they, in queue. They, but they don't they don't create a license. Like they can't tomorrow when they announce a license on you, they can't say, here, there's a new license. They cannot create they one. They can't create one. They wait for um, beer and wines to not be renewed or to be taken right. away from people or sold from one individual to another individual. And that's how they that's how they become available. And in order to they increase the number of licenses in the city of Boston that's done by statute. The, the legislature yeah, has to approve it. The word do in there is separate. But the North End has, I think, a, like a resident to liquor license ratio, like one license every 90 people or something along those lines. It's, it, it, it's pretty dense. I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Does anyone else on the council have a question? Does anyone? Joyce and then Marie. Do you know um, off the top of your head what percentage of his business is takeaway versus people ordering stuff and sitting down at the table? I, I do not, Joyce. Yeah. I mean, it's a question that could probably easily be answered, you know, but do I know it all? No. That's how I discussed with him. Yeah. If you really want to know, I can find out. I do point. know. <laughs> Marie. Yeah, I want to ask you something. The daily catch has a type of situation where people that are poor and go out to eat and they want to drink, you bring in your own beer and wine. Is that how it works on the daily catch? They don't, not anymore. They have a beer and wine. It used to be like that. BYOB. It was like that. Yes. Okay. Because I don't I think, think we have any, any more than not that BYOBs. There's not the city of Boston. Right, yeah, because yeah, the yeah. city of Boston didn't court and control it. Is that what happened? I don't know, but like oh. George, George is actually pretty good at this stuff. I, I, I think, I think that if I'm not mistaken, I don't think it's allowed in Boston uh, to bring your own uh, liquor anymore. Uh, people will call every time. Uh, you know, they call often to the restaurants, establishments, see if they can bring their own bottle of wine and stuff like that. My understanding is, from having talked to the licensing board, that it's not allowed, and it's not allowed for all the reasons. You know, it's very hard to control what people are bringing their own bottles. Anyone have any other questions? Marie? No? Does anyone want to make a victim? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, the, the, uh, the number of licenses per resident in the North End, um, <coughs> the study we did a year ago showed 110 licenses per person. 
Uh, sorry, people. For every license, people. Yeah. Yeah. one license for every 110. Uh, if I may say so, it's, 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 kind of a, it's a number that's thrown out there anyway. It does not that it means much since we're one of the biggest the tourist attractions in Boston. Uh, we're not getting those licenses to serve just the folks in the community. You know, the licenses are not just meeting uh, public demand for those who live here. Those licenses are obviously we have a lot of foot traffic. If we didn't have the amount of foot traffic we have here and we weren't catering to as many people as we're catering here, uh, there wouldn't be 120 restaurants. You know? So that assumption that the licenses are here to serve just the community uh, doesn't apply. Uh, you have to think, think about the 110 people. A lot of those people are minors. A lot of people are not going out for dinner. A lot of people, you know, so if you were basing the ratio of licenses to individuals just on what people live in the community, uh, if you do the math correctly, about 120 people might be 40 people that can drink. So it doesn't make much sense. Just to refresh, just to make sure for us and for everyone else's knowledge, if I'm not mistaken, Dan, isn't it true that a liquor license stay of any sort, I believe, stays with the business or the address so that if the business went out of business in a year, it doesn't stay with the owner. It stays, stays with, with the address. As long as it stays commercial. If you need a, a no. license, you need an active business. At some point, let's say, for example, um, he had a beer and wine license and he went out of business. He couldn't just pocket license that. At some point, the licensing board, whatever it may be, can revoke it. Um, uh, no, the, way, the way that works, he, yeah. can, sell he, would, he can sell it. He yeah. can sell it, but he just can't hold it and do but nothing. If he goes into bankruptcy, the bank owns Ban If he goes into bankruptcy, that's another issue. If bankruptcy owns it, bankruptcy court can hold it, and then there's no period. The license, the license board cannot revoke that license and take it back, which we just saw the situation with. The address of the license doesn't mean that the license has to stay there. It doesn't have when to stay there. When you transfer the license, it changes the address of the license. The ownership of the license is the person whose name, who, the person who owns the license, the person who, right. who acquired the license from the city, whatever that and person may be. And if he sold it within the neighborhood, the transfer, they would have to come before us. Correct. To transfer and the license from 65 Salem, say to 63 Whoever, or if there was a new owner, let's say he decided to sell it, new owner would have to apply. But they but can't hold that license. Just can't hold the license and in the, so, in the you know, they don't. They can't do it for infinity. They, I think they have 90 days, actually, and then they can ask for an extension. You have to call I don't think you have any you have time. time. There is one year, there's one year time we can hold the license with the establishment of the The license is up for renewal in November. If you go up and renew your license in November and you don't have a establishment operating, the city will take the license back. You don't have a pocket license. Exactly. It's not, it's not far. Exactly. So does anyone else have any questions? Anyone want a motion? I make a motion. Motion to? I make a motion to support. Anyone second the motion? So there's been a motion to uh, to support um, Pauly, 65 Salem Street. Um, the motion's been second, seconded by uh, Marie. And it's to operate a uh, CV Seven Day Mountain Wine license at 65 Salem Street, and the hours of operation will be from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. All in favor? Ten and all in opposition. Ten to one. Approved. Ten to one. Congratulations. Is one opposed? Mr. President, members of the board, thank you for the time. And the next up is, um, the next one is 341 um, Hanover Street, uh, the wine bodega. Um, Carrie is here and she has applied to the licensing board to remove a restriction in the license in order to allow the sale of malt beverages in addition to the currently allowed sale of wine. So basically they have a wine uh, business that can sell only wine, they cannot sell beer, and she would like to uh, remove that restriction so she can Hi, thanks so much for having me here tonight. I'm very nervous. Um, I came before you four years ago uh, as someone petitioning to buy the wine Bottega um, and to have that license transferred into my name. Um, and I told you I was going to create a different place, a different kind of wine shop. There's lots of wine shops in the neighborhood. I think we've really succeeded in being um, something unique. We really focus on education and on small, interesting, off the beaten path wines. Uh, we've won Best of Boston in both Boston Magazine and the Improper Bostonian. We are featured, featured in Food and Wine Magazine as one of the top natural wine stores in the country. Uh, we got a little blurb from the New York Times uh, Magazine once, so it's been a great success. 
Um, even more exciting, really, to me, has been becoming a part of this neighborhood. I know I came before you, and no one knew me, you know what I was trying to do. Um, but uh, it's, it, really, it really means a lot to me. Um, I just had a baby nine months ago. <laughs> and um, my uh, block on Hanover Street threw me a surprise baby shower. Um, which really meant a lot. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> um, anyways, so I really do, um, this neighborhood is, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Mommy hormones. Um, but um, so we want to um, start selling beer. Uh, we have a beer and wine license, um, but it has a restriction on it that says for the sale of wine only. Um, it's nothing that anyone I've ever talked to seems to have seen before on a license. Um, we're not going to, if you've seen the shop, it's very small. We have no plans to change anything dramatically. We're seriously going to sell about, I don't know, seven or eight beers at a time. But it's just really something additional for our existing customers. And we're here, of course. <laughs> um, and we're going to keep with the theme of what we do. So these are going to be small, crazy, weird beers from strange places in Italy that you know no one may have ever heard of. Um, but that's what we do. Um, it's also, you know, we talked about adding beer in as a support for your business. Um, it's tough. We work really hard and we keep coming up with different events and anything we can think of to make the business um, make the business flourish. So this would just be an extra boon. You know, there's a lot of, of small retail shops in the North one and that have closed their doors. Um, are we doing terribly? No, we're doing great, but now I pay nanny $17 an hour and I have to <laughs> come into work. So something extra, um, you know, to help support that would be, um, would be fantastic. Thank you, Carrie. Does anyone on the council have any questions? Dan. Do you plan to sell single beers? We don't. The typical well, single beer would be like breaking a six-pack of Bud. Some of the beers that we might sell are actually beers that are um, they're the size of wine bottles. They're a larger format, but they're like $20 for a single beer. It's not like a typical single beer walk-in, you know, put a paper bag and drink on the street. It's, a, it's more like a wine in that sense. Do you feel as if it's a... An Actually, if there's a need, uh, you know, you did sign a good neighbor not to sell beer. Why, why are you coming back in front of us now? Well, I was, I was told at the time that if I came back in three years, um, that you would be open to hearing my petition again. I waited an extra year so you kind of know who I am and, and what I'm about, and then I'm not going to go crazy. We do have a demand, um, you know, from our customers asking for us to do it, and now they make two stops. They might come to us and go somewhere else. But I do think, again, if we're looking for organic, biodynamic, sort of natural beers um, and that aren't readily available in the North End. Um, there are places to buy, you know, interesting artisan beers, but again, there'll be things, if you see the wines on our shelves, they're not things that you see anywhere else either. Where do you live? You live in the neighborhood, right? I don't. I moved to be closer to my parents, too. I'm a single mom, so I moved to, back home to be closer. So I'm in the burbs now. I thought you lived in that building. That's why I'm asking. Uh, You're no. always there. So. I'm always there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you, can you describe your, just your customers in, in general, like the type of clientele? Yeah, we have... Um, those ladies would sit out here, we can see... Where yeah, we can see people back here. But um, it, it's great. We have an interesting mix of customers. Um, we have um, a lot of uh, people who live in the North End who come in every day, which I don't know if you mean the age group, or um, but everywhere from... Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of college kids coming in, which seems to be a concern. I do think that they're frequenting other places. I'd say we have mostly young professionals, um, young families, people who lived in the neighborhood for a long time. Uh, we also have a lot of tourists who come in, you know, we're right on the Freedom Trail, and would love to be able to sell some local products, which is where the beers come in handy for us as well, because people want something from Boston. And we have some local wines, but honestly, they're not that great. Um, we don't sell them, but <laughs> Boston has them. Um, so it would be something to offer the tourists. And we're also a destination for wine geeks, really from around the country and even from around the world. So people come to visit us to find something new when they're here from, you know, San Francisco, from Canada, from New York City. Um, and so it's servicing their crowd. So. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I've been in the store a few times. I don't, I don't even drink. I, don't, I usually go in to say hello, but it's like very uh, exotic kind of wines. Yeah. And, Kind of makes me want to drink again, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not snobby. I mean, we're snobby. Ones. But it's not. It's a really, it's a really nice, it's a nice layout. Whoop, whoop. So you're gonna do like craft beers, like those big 22 ounce bottles, and. Yeah. Yeah, it's not gonna be like the hand of a liquor store where you go in and you buy a six pack of Bush Light because you only got four bucks in your pocket. Not like that. <laughs> we have one fridge, which is seriously the size of like the fridge that you have in your house, and it will just be one shelf in the fridge where we'll have something, and then one small um, shelf. Uh, 
So you don't plan on selling like 30 packs? Or, um, <laughs> does this I allow you to sell kegs of beer by any chance? Uh, that you're like, looking for kegs? Is that this would allow her to sell beer. It just would allow her to sell beer. They don't specify, hey, she's only going to sell craft beer. We don't have the room to store kegs. I mean, it's, honestly, we don't have cases. One thing that this will allow us to do is we do, um, we're a catering partner to certain catering establishments in Boston, like Number Nine Park has a catering room, so they'll um, buy wine from us for our parties, which are you know anywhere in the state. Um, and it's tricky because we only get the wine business, but now if they have a beer and wine party, we would be able to get the wine, but it would literally, we would just get it and then deliver it um, to them. Do you so have a date at the licensing board? Yes, it's, uh, just said it, it's not this yeah. Wednesday, but the following one, the 19th. Thank you. <laughs> I just looked at it. Does any, anyone on, Anyone else? Any of the public have any questions? Choice. I remember when you first came, and I think I was a lot of council at that point. One of the concerns that was issued back then was not about you getting a craft beer addition to the license, but what happens when you decide to sell? Because there's no way that people can restrict who you sell it to, and it could become another sell you know, 24 packs of cheap garbage to the students in, in the neighborhood. So that was the big concern. I mean, I've been in your store. I think it's great. I don't have a problem with you know, what you're trying to do. But I do remember that was a big concern when you first came, was that you, know, you have a great business, but if you decide that you're going to become a full-time mom and you're going to sell the business to somebody else, there's no control over having yet another package store. In the neighborhood, the um, the way that was addressed at this meeting, and so I, um, for the following uh, new room meeting that I went to, we had a plan for that. And unfortunately, Craig Hughes is no longer with us, but his wife is now my landlord. Um, and Jane wanted to be here tonight, but she had something that came up. John, Jane had a payment. If you know her, um, and they are people who take whatever business goes into their very ser seriously, and they, I mean, believe me, the vetting process I went through with Craig was quite exceptional. Um, and they're not going to let just anyone come into that space to do that. I also think given the reputation of what I've established, if I was to ever sell the store, the value in it wouldn't be to change it to a package store. You know, we're internationally recognized now as the wine Bottega for natural wine, um, and it's the wine Bottega. We're not gonna change it to the Bottega, you know, which sells beer. Um, and I think that that's, you know, the, the goodwill and the, and the value that goes into that sort of has, has created something that would keep that from ever happening. So, so I guess there's two, two things that I would say would support that. Steve. Matt. Yeah, I just I, I want to just say something because I was on the council four years ago when Kerry came the first time. I voted against the, uh, you know, just the, I voted for just the wine only piece and the beer. But, you know, I've since changed my mind. I, if I was on the council today, I would support this. I think we know Kerry now. We know what type of business she runs. She did what she said. You know, she didn't say one thing and, and did another. She has, you know, I think developed a stronger uh, reputation with the awards. I see a lot of community people that are in there. This is not a new license. It's really just you know added. And so I, I have full confidence that you know she says she's going to do with the with the beers. This and she's doing something a little bit different. So uh, I just wanted to say that you know if I were on the council today, I would support. It. Sure. I think that that's a very valid point too. You know, we're talking about business people in the community. We do have business people in the community who don't do the right thing. We have people that don't make promises, come in, they tell us how great we are, how nice we all are, and they don't do the right thing. But you do have people like Eric who is doing the right thing. She's got a, an established business. She's worked very hard at it. Uh, she's got the, the, the awards to, 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 to show it in the national and international level, but also in the community. She's been very good to the community. She, Every year about these times they get to start getting ready for the Halloween uh, kids coming by and stuff like that. They do make a big effort. And uh, you know, she is a part of our community. She's part of our business community. She she contributes locally. And I think that we need to start establishing a system in which we award those people who do the right thing and we don't award those who don't. In this case we have somebody who's doing the right thing. She's trying to, uh, to, 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 to capture a section of the market that is different than what other people are doing when it comes with, uh, with beers of, 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 of a different caliber, of uh, uh, you know, naturally made, you know, I think it's a perfectly uh, good fit for the community. I don't, I don't see how, um, how even if somebody did buy a business, they could turn it into a package store. It's too small, people are gonna go to, to you know, the White Hat or 
7 Eleven to get a, a 30 pack of Bush Light. I think you're doing the right thing. I think you, your value, if you ever did want to sell it, is as a craft uh, seller of, of good wine and some beers. I don't you know, sell any blood products or anything. Else. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone want a motion? Can I make a motion? I'll make a motion to, su yeah. to, su to support that. Can I make a uh, You want a motion? Good job. Huh? I'll second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a motion to support uh, the wine Bottegas uh, application of the licensing board to remove a restriction from the license in order to allow the sale of malt beverages in addition to the current wheat allowed sale of wine? I'll second the motion. I'll second it. Thank you. So we have a motion to. Um, to remove the uh, restriction in the license to allow for the sale of all beverages. So, um, we're removing the restriction and allowing uh, 341 Hanover Street, the wine bodega, to uh, sell, um, sell beer. Most likely back there, but yes. sell beer nonetheless. All in favor? Eleven zero unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. For Foster Street. I thought about So Four Foster is next. It's uh, Keith Burton and Kelly Lanzani. Did I say that right? Yeah. Applicants have filed uh, an appeal for variance to the zoning um, to the zoning code to change the legal occupancy of the basement. To residential living space as part of the conversion of the, uh, of the former multi unit building to single family use. Wish I could do that. <laughs> it actually, that's an error, I think, in the original yeah. email. Yeah, it, it was always was a single family. Yeah. It's always been a single family? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a pretty small footprint. I still wish I had a single family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just a, a little bit of history uh, with us. We've uh, combined, lived in the neighborhood for 11 years now. Um, we were married just over a year ago, about 18 months uh, now, and then uh, we decided to really set down roots uh, by purchasing in the North End. Um, and we saw a unique opportunity with 4 Foster Street. Uh, it was a place that had fallen really into uh, some pretty serious disrepair. Uh, it was quite an eyesore on that street. Um, but with that, it came at a good price. Uh, so uh, we purchased it. There was uh, an extensive renovation and rehabilitation project uh, that went on originally. Um, and that's been completed to the point where we do have occupancy uh, of the building. Uh, we were uh, we received that as of June 1st. Um, and during the uh, renovation project, which ran from basically the very beginnings of January uh, through May, uh, we also uh, or, uh, issued an application uh, to make the basement uh, living space. Uh, so this is a single family residence. Uh, we'd like to finish the basement just to maximize the investment. Uh, be able to use that space uh, for kind of a multi-purpose room, you know, sort of den, uh, children's play area when we get to that point, uh, you know, kind of you know, home office study type of an area, uh, really just maximize the space. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, become like a rental property or something like that. Uh, it will continue to be, um, you know, a single family residence. So uh, we were denied on the original permit uh, or this uh, extension of the permit for uh, floor area ratio or FAR. Uh, for exceeding that, uh, it'll be roughly in the area of about 160 square feet, I think. So think of like a 13 by 13 type area um, is what we were exceeding it by. That's what uh, the ISD came back with. They basically just saw the numbers black and white. Uh, so we've since gone through the appeals process. Uh, we have worked to notify all of our neighbors. Uh, all of that went out certified mail a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week we appeared in front of uh, ZLC. Uh, which is basically the committee that stands on NURA. Uh, they basically heard us to decide whether it was worthy to sit in front of NURA. Um, and actually, uh, to our, uh, our surprise and certainly our satisfaction, uh, they decided that uh, we actually don't even need to uh, appear at NURA, as it turned out. They, they felt that because it was contained just inside of our home, we're not using it as an income property, uh, it didn't rise to the level of being something that was sort of disruptive to neighbors or controversial. Uh, any of the remaining renovations are all fully contained inside of the unit, uh, so there won't be things like street closures or excessive noise outside to you know such cause of disturbance to the neighbors. So it's all interior. It's all interior. And when's your ZBA date? Uh, ZBA date is next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Yeah. The 18th. 18th. Yep. Which is also my birthday. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm hoping things go you know doubly well that day. 
Honestly, if we had a committee that met before, you wouldn't be here either. But um, the process is uh, that, that's our contemplated not having you come. But I don't want to set precedent, and all of a sudden, no one comes. We, yeah, that, that's that's all right. We uh, we need you know obviously the support of the neighbors and, and you as a committee to uh, to give us a chance to see the end. Does anyone have any questions? Is there a kitchen bathroom? No. No kitchen bathroom? Yeah. Okay. No kitchen bathroom? No. No. Okay. Just one kitchen. I'm the lone cook in the house, so I won't let any bills have any control over that. <laughs> no kitchen. Anyone? Please, straightforward application. I'll make a motion to support it. A motion to support on an appeal to change the legal occupancy uh, of the basement of Fort Foster to uh, expand the residential living space. Anyone second? All second. Motion to second. All in favor? All opposed? Zero. 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 All opposed? There is none. 11 nothing. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's the great. <laughs> <laughs> <Right, very good. laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, must be you guys, Paul, yeah. that I know. 27 o'clock. <laughs> They've applied uh, also to the Zoning Board of Appeals to, uh, for variance to extend the living, uh, the living space on the first floor unit of the basement. Pretty much similar right. application as Fort Foster. So, yeah. so the, uh, I'm Paul Benedetto, the owner. I've owned since uh, 2010. This is my father, Paul Benedetto. It's much like the, um, the last one. I'm just looking to uh, add about 300 square feet to the, uh, the basement to extend my living space. Uh, it's just going to be, um, you know, just a, an office or a den type. We will be adding a bathroom down there, and um, that's about, that's really about it. It's a, it's a pretty clean cut, and uh, we got denied for the same uh, floor area ratio excessive. When's your ZBA day? It's tomorrow morning. Oh, wow. That's September. Uh, there's currently a uh, ten. My, uh, my neighbor on the second unit um, actually did go forth and um, do over the basement when I was buying the place. <clears throat> these are all condos, right? Yeah. Yeah. Seven's a pretty big building, so these are all condos. <clears throat> recently converted to a condo unit. These are all occupancy in the whole building. You live in this unit? I do. He's the first floor unit right off the street and the basement directly below and it's about 300 square feet. We'd like to make it into a living space. Yeah. So, so what did you, you bought the, the basement from the condominium association? Well, when I bought it, it was deeded. And, uh, you know, the construction in the back, the unit was, you know, underway. So, I, you know, I, I thought that, you know, just buying it is actually the selling point of the seller, that, you know, his basement space. And, you know, I, I really didn't see any issue because the construction was already going on. So the unit in the bank was, uh, they were doing, uh, they were expanding to... Uh, they did, yeah. They got so it. the studio that's one of the problems in the bank, yes. same setup, they had the basement, they expanded to the basement, you bought the apartment upstairs, what type of, uh, what, what size apartment do you have upstairs? Uh, it's a little over 500 square feet. It's like so about half the size of this one. Yeah, yeah this uh, project was uh, much, much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. And you're not planning to put the kitchen in the basement, are you? No. No. No, no kitchen? No kitchen. Kitchen. Kitchen's upstairs. What's upstairs? Kitchen's upstairs. There's a living room and bedroom. About nine by eleven. The bedroom nine by eleven. Uh, living room. And then another and bathroom. <coughs> and the kitchen's probably what? So just the bedrooms going downstairs and bathrooms? There's no bedroom. It's just going to be a living space. Uh, take the living room from upstairs and move it downstairs. Oh, right. So no bedroom. Right. And no kitchen. No, no bedroom. Did you have? Yeah, no kitchen. <laughs> oh, the kitchen oh, kitchen Do I have to go? Uh, no, no, no. Like, it's, it's about four feet below the sidewalk. So you got windows. There's no window into the basement. Right? On that side, there's no front of the building. Yeah, there's no window. Uh, I haven't applied for one. I think that's no, I don't think you can put a window. There's not enough space between the first floor and the sidewalk. Any other questions? Do you plan to live there or do you? I do. 
I've been living there since about two and a half years now. He lives in the first. I don't know when he finished it, if he planned to sell it. No. Any crazy parties in No. You don't keep passing on that? Those days are over. <laughs> Buy there, buy there, carries. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to support Paul DiBenedetto's application. He has filed an appeal for variance to the zoning code yeah. to extend the residential living space of the first first floor unit at 27 Clark Street into the basement. I'll second. George second. So there's a motion to uh, support. It's seconded by George. All in favor? Yeah, this is